there. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 advisory group, and we are a collaboration among about 70 groups in Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate American independence. And I also teach history at Suffolk University. And our guest today is Jeffrey Griffith. Jeffrey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank and you for having me. Jeffrey is a man of many talents. He uh, works by day in the um, investments, I believe, or in so some business related thing, which really fuels his two passions for history and hockey. Uh, he is uh, has an undergraduate degree, two undergraduate degrees from Chapman University, one in business administration and one in history, master's in history from Cal State Fullerton, and he received his doctorate from the Claremont Graduate School. He wrote a wonderful um, dissertation on Massachusetts election sermons between 1763 and 1793. And he's also the author of a book called The Greatest Collection, which mainly comprises his collection of hockey cards, something we'll probably talk about later. But first, I think we want to talk a little bit about John Hancock and about those election sermons. So um, we're just asking before the show started, what do you think would have, well, first, how did you get interested in John Hancock? And what, I mean, your, your dissertation is one of the first places where you read the name John Hancock and you're not talking about the founder, you're talking about a minister in Braintree. So what's the Hancock family like? Correct. So, so my interest in the Hancock family, um, my father and I for years collected a presidential document um, filling up walls of office spaces that, you know, so we had, we had, um, or we have documents ranging from Washington to Biden now. And during that time, I, I came across a document signed by John Hancock as president of the Continental Congress. And it's a Continental Army Commission hmm. um, dated May 19, 1775. Hmm. So amongst the earliest army commissions that yeah. are created and even predates the, um, the formal formation right. of the Continental Army. Right. Um, this is as so, it's being debated in Congress. Should we form a continental army? Correct. How should we respond to this growing threat from from the British? Mm -hmm. So the um, the subject of Hancock and that document state and all that just enamored me with mm -hmm. with the his role in the in the revolutionary effort. Mm -hmm. and, you know, reading biographies. You know, William Fowler's book. Um, Harlow Giles Unger's mm -hmm. fast-paced written biography. Mm -hmm. um, it served as a springboard for me to get into more formal, mm -hmm. um, you know, more formal studies of right. now digging into the, um, you know, primary source material for Hancock. Yeah, it's interesting. And you were talking earlier about go, going through the American Antiquarian Society's newspapers, which are covering a lot of these events. Yes. And you get um, so what would have happened, you know, one of the big stories we have is John Adams nominating George Washington to be the commander of the Continental Army and Hancock thought he was going to be nominating him since of course he was the big guy in Massachusetts, head of the first corps of cadets. And what do you think would have happened had Hancock been the commander rather than Washington? I, I feel like, I think Hancock's, uh, was very confident in his, in his abilities. Let's say it that way. Yeah. I don't believe believe he didn't have any real world experience on the ground. Right. Now saying that, um, you know, I, I'm sure we're all familiar with Peter Force's American Archives. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, tomes of of let of letters on there. Yes. And it's it's fascinating to me because. It seems like in the historiography of Hancock not getting the commander role mm -hmm. is that he was pushed to the side and that was the end of it type mm -hmm. thing. But reading through these letters that Force chronicled and then that are in other um, archives as well, it fascinates me about how, man how Hancock managed the logistics of the early mm -hmm. war effort, yes. you know, during his 
his presidency through 1777. I mean, it's sometimes a handful of letters, sometimes 10 letters a day to different mm -hmm. states, different generals, different right. um, procuring supplies, procuring arms, um, detailing strategy mm -hmm. on there. And I'm something that I'm fascinating that or fascinated in and studying further is how did the skills and um, and the necessary um, activities, let's say, to run a transatlantic trading empire mm -hmm. that, he, that he had to do that he took over right. from his uncle when he died? Mm -hmm. How did those skills translate into essentially doing the same thing yeah. on a continental level yeah. for... Um, for the war war efforts. Right. And, and, and so he did have that, you know, business background. And sometimes you look at him as he inherited it from his uncle, yeah. but he needed to work at it. His brother yes. doesn't do as well with his business right. enterprises. And, uh, and and then of course he is very popular as a governor of Massachusetts. Yes. He is, is um, elected, reelected, reelected. And then he comes back and, you know, so he is someone who does definitely has great political skills as well as business skills. Right. Yeah. yeah and I, I would say that those skills are what, especially in the early days of, of the war effort, mm -hmm. really helped move things around because he, you know, I feel like he understood the, you've got to move pieces around to get the supplies you need. Right. Right. And I think whether I don't think he ever really got over not being chosen mm -hmm. for the commander role, but his skill set was much better suited in Philadelphia yeah. rather than being on the battlefield. De yeah, definitely. We're yeah. talking with Jeffrey Griffith. He was the author of God Save the Commonwealth, which is a study of Massachusetts Election Day sermon. So what can you tell us about Election Day as a tradition from the 1700s into the, from the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, and what the minister's role was? Yeah, so the minister's role, each, the, back then the elections were held annually. Mm -hmm. And each year, a minister from somewhere in Massachusetts would be chosen and would travel to Boston, um, and give a scheduled sermon or give a traditional mm -hmm. sermon in front of um, all the elected officials that were elected mm -hmm. that year, um, or at least that were present yeah. that way. Um, and what I really liked about that, especially for the years 1763 to 93, is that it gave a consistent time period uh, to study how things had changed, what messages mm -hmm. are lingering or mm -hmm. you know, what what hopes are being held on to what um you know what happened in between each year getting to these sermons and yeah. usually it would be very traditional uh mm -hmm. you know respect your rulers what um especially in the 1760s when it's still mm -hmm. you know protesting Brit british mm -hmm. rule but we're not ready to declare independence. Right. Um, the two most, two of the most fascinating years, let's say, is 1770 and 1775. Yeah, when there were two. There's two of them. Yeah. And it's it's amazing to think of, um, like in the 1771, in the pamphlet, it states how he had 48, not even 48 hours notice mm -hmm. to do this. Who is he? The, which, he maybe? is, um, I'm blanking on the... Um, Chauncey or Cook? Chauncey, it's Chauncey, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, the um, So, it you know, Chauncey writes in the pamphlet that, you know, he appreciates mm -hmm. the listener's uh, forgiveness because he only had you know, less than 48 hours yeah. to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my, what I... Part of the section of the dissertation is from 1771 to 75. Mm -hmm. I compare these more reserved, measured responses to the 
fiery rhetoric of the of the massacre right. Right. so it's like you've got especially in 74 and 75 mm -hmm. um you know the ministers taking one or two steps closer to the mm -hmm. to the massacre oration, orations rhetoric but mm -hmm. just this comparison of these ministers with with the religious perspective trying to keep the community whole right right and the massacre orations you know creating excitement let's say right. it that way yeah yeah we're trying to whip up the keep this memory alive yeah. and the ministers have a different role let's just uh, talk a little bit about why there are two different orations you know why in 1770 yeah um, cook is giving one oration and Chauncey is giving another. Right. So for there, the um, election and the general court got moved from Boston to Cambridge mm -hmm. um, there. So in 1770, it was a debate over charter rights. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the, it, it wasn't as cleanly defined, but the British leaders there that followed the governor were all in Cambridge, right? Listening there, whereas that Chauncey one in Boston was held there because that's the traditional seat of power. So, who had invited him? I mean, who organized that in Boston? I would, it's Sons of Liberty, basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's more, and it's a very um, obviously, it's set, it's May 1770, so there has been couple months after the massacre, right. but we yeah. haven't had a um, massacre uh, oration yet. Right, right. But it's a step towards those massacre right. orations rather than a uh, right. traditional election sermon. Interesting. And then in 1775, again, it's again Reverend Cook, who's in yes. Cambridge, delivering this to the official government. Correct. And, and then, then Langdon's... Yeah doing the the yeah. other um the president of of harvard right and that's um, out in watertown correct uh, where the uh, yeah and it's the same it's interesting reading the the content of the official election sermon mm -hmm. in front of the british because it's kind of like a plea for peace again right. like stopping yeah. short of decrying a, a you know atrocities and all yeah. that where yeah. langdon has no problem calling all no. that out yeah, but, yeah. Um, and you, both are after lexington or these are after lexington and concord are they yes correct yeah, yeah. yeah. um so but like it's interesting because in the cook one you know in the official one mm -hmm. it's like you could feel the tension even in mm -hmm. the pamphlet all these yeah. years later that just like it's a tense, you every you could feel like it's going to get bad type yeah. thing. I mean, it's not good currently, but right. it's about yeah. worse. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Now you make the point that you know these it's a relatively small group. You have a hundred plus elected officials right. there, but then the sermons are also printed, which yes. is how you're able to uh, correct read them. So, what kind of a circulation would there have been, and who's printing them? Is this um, and just how many right are printed? so so the printer the group that printed it was the official um general court printers the assembly printers um so they got they had the contract to you know print broadsides and proclamations mm -hmm. and all that and this was part of the um part of the contract the annual mm -hmm. contract to do this um, from what I've been able to glean from sources is that each member got a pamphlet okay. of, of this, um, mm -hmm. because it's, I have, I have a few physical pamphlets in, really? in my collection wow. as well. And, it, and a couple of them are signed either to ministers, hmm. uh, and then the minister got, got some as well to hand out, okay. you know, either to his local congregation or to other ministers yeah. mm -hmm. or um you know so probably i mean all things probably a couple hundred 250 mm -hmm. or so do you think any would be sold is this something someone would buy in a bookshop I, I don't think 
the printer would sell these specifically. Okay. I think these were uh, printed to printed to order in the sense that he, they were allocated, okay. allocated. Like it's not a. Um, I'll compare that to the Boston Massacre oration mm -hmm. pamphlets yeah. again, because mm -hmm. those there are newspaper advertisements mm -hmm. printing selling those pamphlets. Mm -hmm. Um there. So I, I think the focus really this was a um but then you'll he, there's a um uh you know there's letters talking about other Boston elites mm -hmm. you know they're connected to formal political leaders that talk about reading the election sermons through in the pamphlets. Wow. So they circulated enough within mm -hmm. a elite circle. Mm -hmm. Was it kind of an honor for a minister to be chosen or was it? It, it uh, was, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was an honor and it, I mean, outside of like Chauncey, I believe did too. Mm -hmm. um, a, a few of them did a couple within my time span. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like um, John Hancock's grandfather did one in the 1720s. Okay. And that's the only one he ever did. And he mm -hmm. had, I mean, he had what, a 40, 50 year yeah. career. Yeah. And got chosen once. Well, yeah. Um, for it, mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. oh. So, covered in the newspapers at all? So the the it was typically um the same line that um it was a list of who was elected mm -hmm. underneath, and on the description above, it was you know election day occurred yesterday let's say or whenever the date was mm -hmm. and chauncey picked preached a um sermon of you know from the word and it and it gave the main biblical passage that he okay. used so it was a um quick blurb mm -hmm. um, yeah. of what what was said but not necessarily the message okay. but you know building the checklist for this dissertation of what i needed to use yeah those newspapers were incredible because it gave me what I was looking for. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So um, you do talk about the biblical texts that yes. uh, where they come from. Most of them are Old Testament. As yes. To New Testament. What do you make of that? Um, it's a very, I mean, the Old Testament is much more authoritative mm -hmm. than New Testament. Um, more, um, you know, Fear God, fear your leaders, mm -hmm. um, all that. It's mm -hmm. um, it is fascinating that they are mostly Old Testament, mm -hmm. um, because of that. But yeah, it's that strict, um, you know, God is King, God is rulers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, then obviously there's also a bit about judging of kings. Yes, you know, the, you know, the whole yeah. 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 I mean, especially once we get into the arbitrary power discussions and all that as well yeah yeah um, and you have one text from romans 13 4 that's used both in 73 and in 87 that yes he is the minister of god and there and there for good yes uh, it's a hopeful thing about whoever is in power i think totally yeah, yeah, yeah. well which um, i mean 73 is an interesting year for that verse specifically to be used because mm -hmm. i mean it's kind of a uh you know, we're kind of in a sim, and it's May, so we're a few months before the tea party. Yeah. Um, but like, it's that's an, an amazing part of this. Yeah. Focus yeah Hutchinson's on, really under attack in that. Right. Too. But like, yeah. it's this peaceful time, but we know by 1774, yeah. right? It's devolved incredibly sure. by sure. then. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're talking with Jeffrey Griffith coming to us from Southern California, and he is the author of God Save the Commonwealth, a study of Massachusetts Election Day sermons from the 1760s, 70s, 80s, 90s. I think one of my favorites is the one that's used then in 1791, I think it is, when things seem to have calmed down. You've had all this term like Chase Rebellion. you had the various contentious things. And this one is, and also in Judah, things went well. That's yes. Right. Yeah. 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 It, it's just it the trajectory over these 30 30 years and 33 sermons I is yeah. in there with the um 
you know, two extra ones in seven or the extra one in 1770 and 75. Yeah. And then there was an extra one in 1780 when the constitution was, was there, but no, it's like by 1791, it's we're back to, you know, things yeah. are well, respect yeah. your rulers. Mm -hmm. um, and just, uh, it's that 30 year stretch is such an yeah. amazing yeah. whirlwind. It is. It is. And then, and then you have some about tolerating dissent and debate. Yes. These are, uh, it, it's interesting, these different themes that you've isolated in these sermons. It's not just respect your rulers or right. let's overthrow the rulers, but there's a lot of debate within. Right. Because, I mean, the, the thing as well with dissent is mm -hmm. it's one thing in 1760 when you're the one dissenting yeah. compared to the 1790s. Mm -hmm. when um you know uh shay's rebellion i talked about yes it in there it's another thing that when now that that group's in power mm -hmm. do you do they view dissent the same right you yeah. know because yeah. i mean that's a and how is the by how is the yeah. biblical text used to yeah yeah confirm power compared to challenge power it, it's interesting and some British commentators talked about this black regiment by which they meant the ministers and they accused the ministers really of fomenting dissent and whipping it up in the 1760s and 70s. Do you find that to be the case that and was anyone using this sermon as a time to tell those in power to change their ways? So I would say in the election sermon series, you know, stretch of sermons I'm doing or looked at here. From the 1760s to out 1773, we just talked about. It's really trying to cling. They they're really trying to cling to peace and reconciliation. Um, mm -hmm. That yes, we're protesting. You know, Parliament's mm -hmm. gone gone off the rails, but we can get back to to what's mm -hmm. good. You know, yeah. on there. 1774 is um, Gad mm -hmm. Hitchcock mm -hmm. on there, and it's the comparison or the similarities in his election sermon to Hancock's massacre oration a couple mm -hmm. months earlier mm -hmm. is striking because language really? like that in my mm -hmm. stretch of time has never been hadn't been used before. Mm -hmm. And then Langdon's in um 75 mm -hmm. um you know is um mm -hmm. electric, you know, very Picking up arms and defending yourself. Um, so there, mm -hmm. 1776, the feeling of declaring independence is mm -hmm. close. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not apparent yet, but like that feeling is that mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the American colonies and about to be mm -hmm. um, states and such mm -hmm. are. Um, you know, it's it's impending, and it was within yeah. within a few years. So, like that, seventy four to seventy six, especially. I I agree with that. Those three examples. Um, yeah. Now, the other thing going with the um, ministers' role in promoting dissent here is every Sunday they could be doing their own thing as well, but mm -hmm. with this being a one off sermon. Mm -hmm. Vote 74, 70, 75 Langdon and 76 are um, basically the most revolutionary and um, mm -hmm. like in the 1760s, if dissent is defined as honorable protest within the system, you know, trying to repair a good system, then it's promoted. But mm -hmm. there's a, I think it's 1767 or 1768, where the minister flat out says, we are not looking for independence. We are not looking for right. separation mm -hmm. in there. So, you know, there's yeah. a limit until 1774 on in the election sermons mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what um, what type of dissent and protest is appropriate. Interesting. Was there ever any concern, you know, to telling the ministers, you know, knock off politics? I mean, I'm wondering if someone like Jonathan Mayhew is ever invited to do this. And if right. anyone says, 
your job as a minister isn't to engage in politics. There is, and it might be the 1776 one, I'm blanking on the, but it's in that 1770s radical era or more extreme era where one of the ministers directly addresses about um, describing or detailing politics and becoming involved mm -hmm. and that he gives biblical principles on here's why it's important for the church mm -hmm. to speak mm -hmm. on it. But um, it's one of the things Could I stuck with the pamphlets mostly and mm -hmm. it would be fascinating going through these ministers letters oh, yeah. of like when what were the letters requesting that they give these sermons? Did they mm -hmm. have to get approval on their, mm -hmm. on their sermon notes? Did right. they, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, what, or find one of these handwritten sermons yeah. and compare it to the pamphlet that yeah. got them. Yes. So one of the examples of that, right, right there in the 1775 one, the um, cook one, the official one, mm -hmm. the official British one. Yeah there's a um where he's talking about protest on there mm -hmm. and he's pleading for for peace mm -hmm. and in parentheses in the pamphlet it says something to the extent of even though the protests are justified like you know due to what's been done all there mm -hmm. so i spent a paragraph in the dissertation yeah. uh uh detailing and describing did he say that mm -hmm. or did he just print that? Yeah, yeah. And from the content or from the context, mm -hmm. I don't think he said it out loud, but okay. he put it in print um, because it doesn't flow contextually if you're mm -hmm. reading it out loud. Interesting. Um, so like there's this balance that was trying mm -hmm. to be done. Yeah. So he gives two of the approved sermons when the kind of patriots or radicals or whatever yes. call them are having their own. Do you yeah. know anything more about Samuel Cook? Not specifically why I like I did a um I believe he was more of a um of a um traditional minister. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think he did yeah. eventually I, I'm not sure how much he, he supported the revolutionary cause right off, but no, it is fascinating. The, um, the, how the same guy got picked twice, yeah. five years yeah. apart yeah. that uh, how I was just saying, yeah. you know, Hancock's grandfather had a 50 year career and got picked once. Yeah. Yeah. He took got picked twice in five years. Yeah. By the same group, essentially. So yes. maybe he's the approved guy. Yeah. And, and I wonder, you know, they are addressing the people in power. Do any of them say anything about the riotous behavior of the populace? I mean, they're talking about the need for peace. Are they saying, you know, these people need to stop smashing windows, tearing down houses and that kind of thing. It, it's heavily implied, but there's no reference to, um, there's no reference to American protesters being in the wrong. Okay. Like, like the, um, you know, throw, just burning the uh, British official's house. There's, yeah, yeah. there's no decrying over that. It's mm. just pleading for peace. We need, you know, right. all, yeah. all yeah. this. But there's no um, specific example of like, you know, when there's the, uh, the, um, the offer to, to come back and uh, to mm -hmm. support the British, except for Hancock and Adams, like there's no mention yeah. of that. Right. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So we're talking with Jeffrey Griffith about his book on his dissertation on Massachusetts election sermons. Um, you also are a collector of, um, well, principally hockey cards, but you also have a John Hancock card, the, the Duke Tobacco Company. I do, yes. So can you tell us about that series, The Great Americans, and how Hancock yeah. winds up on a um, tobacco card? Absolutely. So late in the, in the late 19th century, you know, we're getting into the commercialism and we're promoting products and all that. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, packs, boxes of cigarettes, mm -hmm. The companies Allen and Genter, do you know W Duke and Sons and all that to promote their products would include trading cards mm -hmm. in there. And traditionally, we think of 
baseball cards. The yeah. Honus Wagner is among the yeah. Yeah. most yeah. famous um, ones. Ones there are, and um, but several of these sets were non-sports cards. Mm -hmm. In 1888, W. Duke and Sons did a famous Americans mm -hmm. set, and there were 50 total subjects in mm -hmm. it. And one of them's John Hancock. Yeah. And it's fascinating of how um, the celebration of American history there mm -hmm. and who W. Duke and Sons deemed important in 1888. Yeah. Because how did it's a good highlight mm -hmm. into the, um, the, how the late 19th century viewed this mm -hmm. revolutionary era. Yeah. Like, on, yeah. I don't know if, can we, can there we see this? Oh, there's, yeah, the Hancock, he's yeah. up there with the Liberty Bell, but there are these 50 yeah. individuals. Absolutely. They're all men. Nine of them are from the revolution, the yeah. revolutionary period. Uh, and six from the Civil War. And then there's yeah. some inventors and a couple of people whom I couldn't identify, you know, Lawrence Barrett or, um, mm -hmm. you know, who he was. I mean, I don't. Jonathan yes. probably does. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Elisha Kent Kane. I mean, famous at least enough to be on a trading card back in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So this is the genesis then of the trading cards. The, it is. So these are the very first yeah. um, or among the very first widely distributed trading cards. Interesting. It's um, interesting. And these would have been more regional likely, but they're widely, um, there's mm -hmm. one-off, you know, printed yeah. cards here and there. But yeah. Um, but yeah, these are the first widely um, mm -hmm. distributed trading cards. Mm -hmm. And I understand you have like the largest collection of Wayne Gretzky memorabilia. I do, I do. So I, I have a over five thousand different Wayne Gretzky cards. Wow. There and then um, the the on Instagram when we were promoting this this mm -hmm. piece, um, I self published a book when I when I was at Chapman. The um, detail checklisting and detailing all of Wayne Gretzky's cards through 2008 at that point. Wow. wow. Um, and I was able to present it, present him with the book and it was a memorable experience and served as a um, springboard to um, that book is still on display in the collector section of the hockey hall of fame. Really? Um, it's in one of the cases there. Mm -hmm. Um, and is in their um, resource center mm -hmm. as well. And wow. then that helped me, gave me the opportunity to research further in the resource center. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did my master's thesis was, was on the Hockey Hall of Fame. Oh, really? Okay. It's on the Hockey Hall of Fame yeah. about how it, um, how the Hall of Fame's location, like city dynamics and mm -hmm. um, how it reflects uh you know, personal behavior, how like one of the people um, was forbidden from being inducted because of his off ice behavior. Really? Like, using the Hall of Fame displays and inductions to view mm -hmm. wider societal issues. Mm -hmm. um, and then that thesis was used in an official Hall of Fame publication. Mm -hmm. And then got me the opportunity to do the greatest collection. Mm -hmm. So um, can you tell us about the greatest collection? What's yeah, in so the greatest collection is a is a book that looks into the Hockey Hall of Fame's resource center and mm -hmm. and hundreds of the sports treasures that they have have on hand. It it details their um you know the stories behind um the items they have, whether how they collected them, what store what part of hockey history and society's history mm -hmm. they're telling and it's um you know almost 200 pages are just full beautiful full length pictures mm -hmm. of you know detailing how old since 19 well, the 1950s how the hall of fame has connected broader communities to the sport so how does someone who grew up spends his entire life in Southern California, and I'm guessing you haven't played hockey. Correct. Yeah. How did you get so invested in collecting hockey cards? And yeah, so we um, 
it was really the creation of the then Mighty Ducks of Anaheim, now the Anaheim mm -hmm. Ducks on there. That was our, um, you know, my dad and I's first um, introduction to the sport. Mm -hmm. um, and we just fell in love with, with, um, with the game. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to get a signed Wayne Gretzky puck um, back when I was nine. Wow. Went through my cards and started seeing what I had of them. And then, I mean, it's similar to what we were talking about Hancock. I just started learning more about them. And then I spun that into, um, now I collect, as well as Gratzky, the um, Hockey Hall of Fame rookie card. So going wow. back, like that, I have a Lord Stanley card from 1889. Hmm. And then the before first, we knew him as Lord Stanley, the correct. progenitor of the Stanley yes. Cup. Yes. Yeah, so this card predates the Stanley Cup by three years. Um, you know, and then the first quote unquote real hockey card is from 1910. Hmm. Um, so from oh, 1910 man. to today is a vast hmm. hockey card collection as well. Wow. Well, hockey really is a North American sport. So that, that yes. is something that brings Americans and Canadians together again. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, it was just announced the All-Star Game is going to be in Toronto next year. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's our cross-border connection right. just there. Yeah. Very good. Uh, do you think, I, mean, I was just thinking as I was reading your dissertation and reflecting on your other life as a hockey card collector, if, these minister, if there would have been minister trading cards in the 18th century, if these would be the people you'd see on them? I mean, it's their, um, the ministers were the, socially or the, I mean the religious and yeah. leaders and well really the leaders of a community mm -hmm. I mean so absolutely I I would think so um that's um you know every it seems like communities were known by their church and their mm -hmm. minister mm -hmm. um on there because that was a big um effort by John Hancock to for his social community efforts is that he funded and built churches and mm -hmm. bought them bells and mm -hmm. um, uh, Hancock's aunt Lydia, when she passed away in her will, it was um, silver communion, communion mm -hmm. cups that she donated to one of the churches mm -hmm. there. So, I mean, the ministers were a huge, huge yeah. part of the community. So probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And you have, uh, most of them were congregationalists. You have one Baptist and one Ang at least one Anglican yes. who stuck in. So yes. Did you yeah, notice any? Go on. Did you notice uh, any differences among them? I mean, the it, denominational. So, so because the congregationalists are so prominent, especially in the, um, because I think the Baptist is either 1780 or 1790. So he's kind yeah. of he's it would be interesting to get that alternate perspective in yeah, that 1974 yeah. to 76 yeah but so because of the era and it being a one-off sermon mm -hmm. you, you know and there's the traditional election sermons quote on just as a quote unquote here mm -hmm. they follow a pattern type thing yes. right um it's the juicy middle parts of like uh, especially these 1770s ones that um are really set things apart yes that's interesting yeah, yeah. Uh, i know any minister would like to hear all part of the sermon called the juicy part but absolutely the juicy part absolutely yeah. exactly so. it, it it's like when the catholic church dropped latin now we can say juicy part the, right. uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you know, Jonathan is now thinking about um, making these cards. He wants an Ezra Stiles card and says Samson Oakham's card would be the hard to find one. We don't know. Maybe it would be um, Mather Biles, I don't know, or other yes. ministers. So, so, well, thank you, Jeffrey. This has been thank fun you. talking to you. Yes. We've talked with Jeffrey Griffith coming to us from Southern California about God Save the Commonwealth and about the greatest collection, about uh, transcending, you know, covering both election day and hockey to um, great things. At least one of these is still practiced a lot in Massachusetts. I yeah. did 
we recently had a governor's inauguration and there was a uh, minister giving an invocation. And I have to say his invocation was actually more political than the governor's inaugural address. Oh, wow. Yeah. An in in interesting turn of events. And, yeah. Um, I want to thank, thanks to thank you for joining us. I want to thank Jonathan Lane for helping to put this together. And if you have ideas for further topics you'd like us to discuss, send Jonathan an email, jlane at masshist.org. And also we have listeners all over. And so I want to today thank our listeners in Hobart, Tasmania, and Saddle River, New Jersey, Minneapolis, Port Chester, New York, Leewood, Kansas, and Leemore, California, and all places between and beyond. Thanks for listening. And if you send Jonathan an email, he will send you one of our, speaking of cards, how about a Revolution 250 playing cards that we've just come up with as we're working on the, um, the collector's cards of patriots, ministers, loyalists. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Jeffrey, for joining yes, us. Yes, thank you. Now we'll be piped out on the road to Boston.